It is awesome to welcome Tasmanian Jack Jumpers head coach Scott Roth to the basketball podcast. This past season, Roth was the inaugural head coach of the NBL's Tasmanian Jack Jumpers. In their first season in the NBL, the Jack Jumpers finished the regular season in fourth place, defeated the Melbourne United in the semifinals, and lost in the NBL Grand Final Series to the Sydney Kings. Roth played overseas and in the NBA with Utah Jazz, San Antonio Spurs, and the Minnesota Timberwolves before he set out on his coaching career. His coaching career has included stints as an assistant coach in the NBA with Dallas, Vancouver, Memphis, Golden State, Toronto, and Detroit. He's also been an assistant coach in the G League with Bakersfield Jam and a head coach with the Iowa Wolves. In addition to that, he's an extensive experience coaching overseas and with many national programs as well. Coach Roth, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. Wow, what a year. What a year. Yeah, I don't know if you could have scripted that, eh? Yeah, no, it's been, um, you know, the last two years actually has been quite the journey and just um, a complete progress of, you know, leaving the NBA and kind of having this exit plan that I was kind of going through with Minnesota to to get out of there. And, and I'd been watching this league in the NBL and some dumb luck happened and I ended, my, ended up in Perth through a, a different process. And next thing you know, I'm the head coach of the jack jumpers and COVID's happening and can't get home for two years and um, take this team over from scratch. And, you know, most people just said, Hey, be thankful that you have the team and finish 10th or ninth and everyone will be happy and win a few games. And um, I definitely was not about that, but I understood the process of how hard it would be. And yeah, it became, you know, uh, a different version of Hoosiers really at the end of the day. It was just a remarkable story by our players and our coaches and the entire jack jumper community in Tasmania. So, yeah, a whirlwind of excitement and a lot of ups and, ups and downs. So having been in Australia just prior to COVID, I did a little tour. I never made it to Tasmania, but everybody kept telling me I got to go there. They love basketball yeah. and all the stuff that goes with it. And uh, yeah. maybe share the example of your first practice, because you did something really unique for your first practice to highlight the importance of that community in that area. Yeah, it was, it was hugely important for me when I got there. I got there a few months early before I had a staff or anything. I think there was five of us working for in the front office and myself. And it was hugely important for me to get a feel of what it meant to be Tasmania, what it meant to be in this community and in this state. And it's a big, uh, it's a big island. And I spent a lot of time traveling uh, north and south and, and talking to a lot of people. And I created the bloodlines um, of Tasmanian basketball history and trying to unearth uh, all the former players and coaches that had been sitting there for 15, 20, 30 years and kind of went dormant and what they were looking for. And, and so I created the Tasmanian bloodline over the next three or four months to just get my ear to the feel of what was happening and what they were looking for in a basketball team. And everything was resonating exactly of who I am and the kind of person I am and my, my demeanor. And, um, you know, Tasmania is a, a, work, a work ethic kind of place, a blue collar kind of place. People really want hard work and fighters. And they kind of had that under, underdog syndrome of being just off the mainland and sometimes forgotten about and they're very competitive and and um yeah it was just hugely important to connect with them so i created this bloodlines group of former coaches and players which was you know something that we're thriving on and using in our culture and then from that point on i thought it was hugely important that our players when they got into market understood what it meant to be tasmanian so um we had our meetings in the evening about what we were going to do this year and how we were going to progress and i said the next day bring your boots your shoes some clothes and meet me at 8 a.m. outside the gym. And they all looked at me a little bit crazy, like, why are we doing that? And we got there and we went down to a place um, about 40 minutes from our practice facility, one of our sponsors, um, Andrew Smith. And we went to his apple, apple orchard. And um, basically, we put them to work uh, from about 8 o'clock in the morning till 4. Uh, we had three groups. They rotated in the restaurants. They were out in the apple orchards, either picking or um doing stuff with the vines. And then we had people inside the packing areas and we rotated them through. And um, I think our guys about halfway through all of a sudden just, it kind of clicked and they just really started thriving and enjoying it and, and meeting Tasmanian workers and really understanding what was going on in this, in this state. And I thought the best way to do that was to go work uh, our first day of practice. And, and that's what we did. And it started our culture, started our bonding, but more importantly, it, it it really, I think, resonated with the players what it meant to be Tasmanian and what these people were expecting from us. 
a great connection to the local community. And uh, at least we think it's that easy. We just send our players apple picking. Obviously, there's more to it. And as I read a lot of the uh, articles about you and about the team this year, I mean, it was a conscious process on your point to get players who would buy into doing that type of thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we would think pros wouldn't want to do this, but you were actually seeking players that would do that in your team building philosophy. Yeah. You know, I had to find 15 players and obviously um, it's sometimes a hit or miss. You can do all the homework you want, but you just don't know if you're going to get a connection there and to find all 15. I, I, I was hoping I would find seven or eight that would buy in and then I'd have to do the rest and kind of massage the other ones through. And we did a lot of homework and I did a lot of uh, investigating about players that, you know, were maybe needed a second chance or had a chip on their shoulder or were an underdog or were ready to take another step. I was very conscious in, in finding those type of players that were available to me. And, um, you know, when I put that roster together, the first thing that came out was we're going to get the wooden spoon. This is the worst roster I've ever seen, so on and so forth. But what I found was great players that did their roles great. And that's all I was looking for. High character, humble and hungry guys that would want to do something different, that would go on a journey with me. And to be honest, Chris, I was just selling that because I had nothing. Mm -hmm. Offices, I had nothing to sell them. I didn't know where we exactly going to practice yet or play. And I was just selling them on, do you want to try something different? Trust me in this process. I won't lead you wrong. I'll be honored. My words will be my my bond and, and come with me on this journey. And um, that's what I sold. And um, the guys that came um, were fantastic. And there's no coincidence that I pulled a few guys from Perth because the culture was so strong in Perth. And I felt like being in Australia for two years, everything I saw of winning teams there from cricket to AFL were driven by culture. They always had that to fall on during their hard times. And again, my number one goal was their connect the state, find a hard playing group of guys and build a very, very strong culture that would be sustainable long after I'm gone and continue to build that. And I thought then the winds would come and, and the people would enjoy that kind of style. Well, and no doubt your resume and the experiences that you had helped legitimize that for players too, because obviously, and we'll get into that. We'll get into your resume a little bit, but, and with the Trevor Gleason influence and what Perth has done is obviously tremendous there as well. But I want to start with something a little bit different and that, I, and a lot of us can't relate to this. A lot of us maybe take over a losing program, take over a winning program. You took over a blank canvas. Yeah. Maybe first, what are the advantages of that? Well, I guess the biggest advantage is I didn't have to fire anybody or make any <laughs> major changes. Um, and that's really probably it in a nutshell that, again, I think there was five or six of us total. There's three or four in the front office and myself when I got down there. And so, you know, I was buying pencils, papers, envelopes, interviewing doctors, dentists, um, trying to create an office space and a lounge for the players, finding where we were practiced. This uh, renovation of the $65 million arena that we were going to go into was was a two-year project that Larry Katzman tried to do in eight months and um, find a staff of people that I really didn't know except the one that I brought from Perth, Jacob Chance, and, and all that was happening. And um, the benefit for me was um, it was a dream come true because uh, I think any smart coach after you have enough years, you either want to inherit a really good team or you want to start from scratch. Um, and the one from scratch was really intriguing just for me because – um, everything lied on me. If, if we went bad, it was me. There's no one to blame but me. And uh, Larry Katzman, our owner, and Simon Brookhouse really gave me um, the freedom to just do what I needed to do. And, you know, I've said this in the last couple of months, you know, it took me 58 years to find my spot, my sweet spot, my everything that I've absorbed and been hit in the mouth with and knocked down and got back up. It took me 58 years to find Tasmania. Well, and so, they're happy because they extended your deal as well. And I'm sure you're yeah. happy about that. And to be yeah. somewhere with some roots, will this be the longer, if you could see this whole deal through, would, the, would that be the longest you've been in one place? Yeah, you know, in the NBA, probably three years is probably yeah. maybe four. Uh, but three, you know, you just the longevity of coaching is not great, obviously. But in uh, Australia, just where I was in there, it just was a, it was a home run for me in so many ways that even basketball, but off the court and just how they welcomed me there. And so... It took me a long time to find this spot, and I never, I never knew I would, but it was a dream job for me, and, and um, yeah, it was difficult to put the team together, and there's a lot of emotional ups and downs, assigned some players, and then they, they um, reneged a few hours later, and I'm an emotional guy in general, and so um, it, was, it was a tough go, but um, 
it was all going to be my responsibility. And if it didn't work, I could at least know, okay, I had my chance and I, 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 it wasn't my time and I couldn't do it. And luckily things went pretty well. And very well. And uh, great stuff. You referenced your uh, staff with Jacob and then uh, yeah. Jack Fleming, someone who I know yeah. very well and part of our basketball immersion community for a long mm-hmm. time, just being around young, hungry people like that. T- talk about that perspective a little bit in terms of that, because, you know, you and I have been in the game for a long time. So being around some younger people that are kind of approaching it from a different perspective, is that helpful? It's extremely helpful. You know, when I was putting my staff together, um, uh, the first thing I wanted was people that were going to definitely challenge me. I didn't want yes men. I had my eye on Jacob, obviously. It was basically I had a year and a half free interview of watching him work while I was in Perth. I didn't know if he would leave or not, but um, I think he's an up-and-coming coach. He's going to be a head coach here very shortly, and, and you know that's one of my biggest things is, is someone like himself to advance would be a huge thing for me. Just um, I see him as a son and someone that hopefully can progress through and I've given him a lot of responsibilities, but he's young and hungry, and he'll challenge you. And, and Jack Fleming, you know, I didn't know from Adam, and Jack came into the picture from a few friends of a friend, and uh, he's been outstanding. And I got Mark Radford in uh, a Tasmanian legend, basically, to leave his role, which he didn't have to, um, to come take a chance on this job with me and knew the volatility of it. And he could have been in Tasmania basketball for 30 more years and never thought about a check again in his life. And he, he rolled the dice and said, I'm with you. Um, and then I got Mika Vakona, the, the legendary uh, New Zealand player that had just retired and many teams tried to hire him. And within three minutes of my conversation with him, I thought I found my Fijian brother and he's been a mentor and a strong friend and just another guy. So that staff is really very, very strong. I, I think it's the best uh, staff in, in, in the NBL. It's the best staff I've ever put together. And um when you have that kind of confidence in those guys, it allows me just to do what I do best. And I do a lot of things poorly, but I do some things really well. And the things I do poorly, actually, these guys are their strengths. And um, I let them run with it as much as I can. And uh, it's been a good combination. And really, by the middle of the season, I had felt I was with these guys for three or four years. It wasn't like um, we were learning on the fly. It was just it was just happening. And, and it made me feel really good that this group was together. That's great stuff. And you obviously referenced connecting the locals to uh, your team and your organization. And then another part that is referenced a lot in some of your interviews is the players lounge. And this must be some players lounge, right? Because it seemed to, again, be a big part of the team building. And I'm not even saying in yeah. terms of the jazz, it's just, yeah, it, it connected with the players, didn't it? Yeah, it did. You know, uh, uh, again, these are things that were in Perth that I saw that were, were hugely important. And our players rounds is really just a room at the end of the day. We, we had a storage, huge storage room that, um, I was lucky enough to commandeer through the, the basketball site where we practice and they gave us this huge room and took all the storage out of it and we started chopping it up into offices and then made the rest of the players line, which is just a big room, but really it was a bonding point that, you know, our players work really hard. They come in at 7.30 in the morning and they're there till noon. We go through a whole thing during the course of the mornings and at noon lunch is provided and it gives them one more chance to get together, watch NBA games on TV, um, you know, shoot the crap back and forth and have some fun or play chess and, and hang out. It's just another uh, intentional way of them bonding without a two hour practice, go home and I don't see you the rest of the day. And everything that we built there was very culturally uh, driven for me. It was, again, one of the number one things in my mind that had to get done in order for us to take any kind of steps. And um, that was just another small piece of it. But the players lounge was something that was in Perth that I saw these guys come in every single day after practice and, and, and not run home and spend another 40 minutes together laughing and giggling and talking about whatever. Um, and I think it's just hugely important that um, it helped us create this culture. No, that's awesome. And uh, another thing I really enjoyed reading is something that I went through too, and that's that introspection of trying to figure out who you are on the sidelines. And, uh, you know, so many experiences through your years that helped shape that, but you feel comfortable that you discovered that. Can you share a little bit of that process? Yeah, with us? I think for me, you know, um, especially in the NBA world, you're, you're always chasing some kind of model or mode and mm-hmm. you are only can be a certain way. In my opinion, you, 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 in the NBA, for the most part, coaches are very calm. They're kind of cool. They kind of sit down They let things happen. The players play. Um, or the GMs are telling you, hey, we need this kind of guy and you need to be this way, or they're putting you in some kind of um, slot to try to be something that maybe you're not. And you're coaching summer league teams and you're doing some stuff on the side, but 
you have to find your way. And uh, you can't copy Tom Thibodeau. I can't copy Don Nelson. I can't copy those kind of people that I've worked with and been around. I had to be me. And, and it was hard finding that because I had coached at so many different places that um, I was just a robot to some degree. And um, when I got to Tasmania, again, you mentioned before, you know, what was some of the things that were important to me? Well, the first thing was I, I told these people when, I, when they hired me, you're going to get all of me. You're, you're not going to get the versions maybe you've seen, you're going to get Scott Roth. And, and I promised myself that I would be myself, that however this job was going to go, you're going to see how I am. And, you know, I've, I've cried so many times in the locker room, um, uh, emotional stuff on the sidelines, hugs, hitting the rear ends, all the things. It's just me. Um, and I wasn't allowed to really, I felt comfortable being that. And for whatever reason, you know, again, the Tasmanian community just, you know, rallied around some of my emotional things that were going on. But I think it was hugely important for myself to just be who I am and let this happen. And I've waited a long time to get this type of job. And can I make it work and, and be myself? Yeah, stick with itness is definitely a part of your career. And I'm so happy for you and uh, that journey. And uh, you're, you're kind of roughly referencing this. And, and everyone talks about the advantages of being in the NBA and being an NBA assistant. And some of those are obvious, but maybe what's not obvious is some of the limitations of being an NBA assistant. Yeah. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I guess, you know, again, you know, I think for me, the, the biggest thing I had with going in the NBA was my able, my ability to communicate with the players and, and gain trust in Dirk Nowitzki and Paul Gasol and Steve Nash and Steph Curry and guys that I work with. But you don't really coach, per se. You know, that's not what you're really there to do. Um, maybe now in the last few years, it's been more of an offensive coach and a defensive coach philosophy, and that's gone through. But you don't do a lot of coaching in, in general. Um most coaches don't give the reins up that easy to let, let your coaches just go. And, and that's fine. And everyone has their own way. Um, but you, you are in general, either a workout coach for the most part, or you're just throwing out ideas to the general manager, or you're doing scouting reports and you're trying to prep all the, all the stuff that needs to get done to get to that next game. And um, until you branch away from that or coach a G league team or go coach a national team or get something on your own, you really don't know what's, uh, around the corner for you. And, and Don Nelson always used to, always used to say there's a big difference between where you're sitting and 18 inches over. And I, uh, I always laughed at that, but when you get 18 inches over and you sit in that seat, there's a lot of things that are happening that um, uh, you need answers to, or you need to solve and they're all coming to you. And uh, um, it's a great training ground, but um, the NBA is a different, different kind of beast. Well, we have to get your favorite Don Nelson story. If uh, we've had enough of them on the podcast. I don't, even, I don't know if they're legally to be put on TV here. So <laughs> on this podcast, because there's so many stuff, you know, um, Nelly's been a huge influence on me, but I, I would so just say coaches. not necessarily a story, but uh, my last year with Nelly was, um, it was just remarkable because it was his last year with Golden State. We had just got Steph. And our big thing was to get him the winningest coach in NBA history. And it didn't look good in the beginning of the year. We had a bunch of injuries. Monte Ellis went down. Steven Jackson got traded. But uh, Steph Curry then started just uh, rising. We got two or three more G League players that no one probably ever heard of, Reggie Williams and uh, a few others that came in there. And we started winning some games. And it got close to the very end. And the second last game of the year was my scout in Minnesota um, for him to be the winningest coach in NBA history. And and we got it on that on that scout. But the big thing was I lived with him that whole year. I actually lived with him for the entire season. And so um, it was like coming home every evening to your favorite professor. And he would sit up in the evenings with me and after games, and we'd be sitting on his rooftop looking over uh, the San Francisco Bay Bridge and um, smoking cigars. And he'd be drinking doors and just reminiscing or telling stories when he was with the Celtics or watching games on TV or we just played somebody and those would go on to one, two, three in the morning um, every day for the whole season with him. And it was just a remarkable journey to see him go out like, but to go home with him every day, you know, was, it was an incredible thing for me. And that is so cool. That's so cool. So many people would love that experience. And uh, clearly from that and some of the things you've said already, you value your role now as a mentor to younger coaches. Yeah. 
You just talked about your experience in the NBA a little bit. So what are some of your takeaways to do it differently for some of your coaches to get them a different type of experience maybe? Yeah, I think for me, um, the biggest thing is I, I've kind of drifted away from the NBA, to be very honest with you. I, I'm very much a European basketball guy. I've always kind of been that. I've, I've played over there and had a lot of success when I was a player, and I've coached multiple national teams, and I just love the style of play and the EuroLeague teams, and I have a bunch of friends that are coaching over there or general managers that are working over there, and so I follow those teams way more now in the last X amount of years than NBA. I have a few um friends that are still obviously in the NBA coaching or general manager. So I follow their teams a little bit, but the style of play just does nothing for me really in the NBA. And um, we're trying to be like a EuroLeague team really in Tasmania, some kind of balance of that, because I think, you know, the court's smaller. Um, some of the things that we do are significantly more adaptable than watching a European game than an NBA game and philosophies and all those things are quite different. We're probably much more of a European coverage team defensively and how we do things. We play 11 guys. We press up the floor 94 feet or 84 feet, pardon me. Um, we get after you. And that's one of our MOs of, of what we've done. And so I'm hugely influenced by European basketball and the coaches that are there. I just spoke to a general manager just before I got on in Turkey. And um, I just love that basketball style. And, and, and when I take things, I take it from there more so than I would ever now in the NBA. Which makes sense, again, based on the rules and the FIBA game and different things like that. And uh, I want to get back to your national team experiences, too, because those have been unique and varied. But uh, just staying on this a little bit, some of the differences, one of your opposing coaches said that uh, they really loved your false motions, which is a very European type thing. What are some other things that really stood out with your team, which was European influence? Well, I was lucky because, uh, well, I was lucky in two reasons. One, my coaches were real smart offensively. And our, our offense was way behind in the beginning of the year because we sent so much time defensively and I was a defensive coach and my goal was, and really we ended up doing was being the top four in the league defensively. And I thought that was going to be the, our best chance to get into the playoffs. And we did, and we finished, I think third or second or third. And it was a huge statement by us to be that type of team. Uh, but our offense lagged. And um, the big thing was I had Josh Majette, who's, a surgeon basically on the floor and smart and can navigate things and be able to pivot and adjust to things. And, and the second thing is I had a hell of a staff that was really, really good offensive minded and uh, Jacob Chance and Brad and Jack Fleming were super sharp and, and finding ways to tweak things and adjust to the switches. And we did a lot of go screening and we did a lot of, we made our sure our shooters were getting more shots. I had a lot of difficult conversations with Josh Adams and Josh Majed about their shot selection to get, Jack McVeigh and Clint Steinle and our shooters more involved. And as that grew and we spent more time on that uh, and those coaches um, nailed it from that standpoint that we, we end up doing a lot of different things that were um, early in the clock. I'm really big in getting open shots early or late in the clock. The middle stuff is not a great thing to me. We never talked about analytics. I don't know if they, anyone's mentioned that, but I'm not an analytical guy. One, cause I'm not smart. <laughs> um, and a two is a two for me, and I don't care how it goes in. Uh, we just try to get the best shot we could at the certain times of the game. And if we got one early, great. If we got them later, that was even better for us to put teams on their back of their heels. So um, we ran a lot of stuff that would get the ball from one side to the floor was more decoy to get it to the second side of the floor. And a lot of ghost screening and a lot of pick and roll with the jet and um, kept things simple. But we, we really pride ourselves on executing – we saw a switch, boom, we reacted right to it. We knew what we were doing and we were able to punish teams. And again, that was really more my coaching staff than really me. Yeah, well, which is great and humble of you. And uh, you referenced switching and opposing coaches said you guys did a great job attacking switching. Was that primarily a perimeter type attack or were you trying to attack matchups inside? What were you doing? Trying to attack, uh, some matchups and, and there's one or two sets that we had kind of our, I would say, go-to stuff in the fourth quarter. And so we had to make sure that if teams were in drops or they're switching or high, high showing and hedging and, and getting after us, that we had all three options covered. And we drilled that quite a bit of our go-to sets um, and making sure that our players understood exactly what we were looking for and what we were demanding and where we thought these switches would occur. And, and if, it, if it did, boom, there wasn't a lot of thought process. It was just a reaction to a thing. And, and um, our guys were really, really good. And again, my coaching staff, you know, broke these drills down and we're just super sharp on um, pinpointing things that were going to happen from week to week. And, and our players were, again, you know, uh, we didn't have 
uh, great players. We had great role players. And that's not a knock on those guys. But when you looked at us on paper, everyone thought, eh, they're not so good. But we had really good guys that knew their jobs and knew exactly what they were supposed to do. And they were awesome at executing those jobs. And I think that's hugely important in creating a team from scratch and just creating a team when you're trying to find role players. And our guys knew offensively, I'm either a ball mover or I'm a ball scorer. I'm either a switch guy and I'm going to go to the post up and get these kind of looks. And that's what I've worked on all week. And this is what we're looking for if this team does this. And so uh, um, our guys were very, very, our group intelligence was very, very good. You, you referenced depth as a strength, and uh, obviously that relates to having a lot of role players. But I'm wondering with role players, is it is it hard initially to get them to understand that they're all role players? Or are some of them vying to be the best player? No. Or- uh, the, 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 the thing, Chris, the, the, every conversation I had when I put this team together, within the first minute, I said these exact words to all of them. Nothing will be promised to you. Hmm. Only thing that I will promise you is you will be coached. You will be made uncomfortable. And if you want to go on this journey, this is the place to be. But I'm not promising you anything. And the minute that any player or agent started talking about starting or how many minutes my guy will get, it was a politely thank you, but we're moving on to the next guy. And so these guys came in knowing that we're going to play a lot of guys. Some nights you play more, sometimes you play less, but it's all going to depend on the week. And I'm very much a process guy. I'm not a long-term look down the road guy. I'm a day guy. I, I, I got to win the day and then I win the next day. And I don't know who we're playing this weekend, but I'll get to that very soon. And we are very much about going and doing the work and going through the process. And the players knew if they, they played well, I would play them. And, and the other players knew if it wasn't me, they were still up there building culture, standing up, um, rooting on our guys. And it's just not my night, but my other teammates out there, and I'm all in. And um, that's kind of, again, our group was – our strength of our team was our group. Uh, it's awesome to hear this and to, to think about this in the context that you had to do it. Uh, just coming back to the switching and attacking switching. Yeah. I mean, the challenge is obviously, first of all, to identify their switching. The second yep. is it triggers an automatic. Yep. And you referenced some of the drills your coaches came up with. Yep. How did this process come about to get that effective at being able to identify and then flow into this trigger and automatic? Yeah, I think, you know, it was just more preparation week by week. Is You know, you, there's only 10 teams, so it's not like a huge scouting. I mean, nine, nine right. teams. And so there's not a huge amount of. It's not like being an ACB where there's 18 teams and you're, you're playing a lot more games and you're playing Euro Cup games. We're just playing each other every other week almost. So there's not a lot of things that are going to change between teams being in drops or some other different kind of coverages. And you kind of get a feel for what to expect. Now, every now and then someone might throw something at you, but um, it was very much more a situational thing where we started pinpointing certain teams that would probably do X, Y, and Z. And we, Zeroed in on that, zeroed in on that, and then this became part of our practices. Really, it just became part of us of just doing the drill work, irregardless of who we were playing. We just started working on switches. We started working on automatic teams being in drops. Uh, we worked on teams hard showing and, and having a counter or two out of our go-to kind of stuff to make sure that it just became a part of what we were doing, as opposed to now it's per scout per team. And again, my coaches um, were off the charts on just being super sharp and, and, and really intentional and, and really I give them all the credit in the world for, you know, flipping it. We were two and six and we were right there and everyone knew we were right there, but our offense was dragging and it wasn't something that, to be honest with you, I was overly concentrating on too much because I was just driving this defensive mentality with our group and, and um, we just started picking away at it and it just started to blossom a little bit and, it wasn't great, but it was winning. It was winning basketball in the fourth quarter. And we were able to execute and outwork and outsmart and out offensive rebound people and get extra possessions and things that we had been talking about all year to win in the fourth quarters. Uh, in watching some film of you guys, but also a strength in general of, of, of a lot of FIBA basketball, and especially you're talking about your national team experiences, that last whatever you call it, that butter time, the last eight seconds of the shot clock, the last 12 seconds, whatever you define is so important. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think some college coaches, high school coaches don't think about that part as much. Yeah. So that's butter for us. And and, uh, that seven or eight second period there. And 
again, we weren't great at that early on. If you watch this early on, you know, we had Majet shooting 35 footers and Josh Adams taking some crazy shots and ball, you know, like a hand grenade, just throwing it to one guy to the next guy. And um, again, we got more, more disciplined in our shot selection. We knew that, you know, this didn't have to be a, you know, a lot of times in those situations, it's a one five switch and now our point guards on our five. And, you know, it was more changing Jets mentality of, we don't need to shoot this 35 footer to be the hero. Just get by them. We'll create space. We'll empty a corner. We'll make a maybe what we call a Turkish cut on the baseline to, to open up some things. Uh, we'll go screen with our, one of our two or, or best shooters that knew uh, who, who was involved and, or we put a poor defender as a ghost screener. So if our, the poor defender we wanted to pick on, we might run a pick and roll to switch that poor defender back again one more time. So we had, a, we started getting two or three different types of things to allow Majet and Josh Adams, who were the most likely guys to be in those situations to just remain disciplined and trust, trust, trust that you can make another play. It doesn't have to be you. It doesn't need to be the, the great shot over the top of somebody. And, 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 and part of my language is piss away a possession just because they switched on us. And once we started solving some of that or punishing them uh, very quickly on a, a quick, uh, you know, roll and throw back and back into the post real quick at eight seconds and allowing someone to go to work real quick, all those things became hugely important. But that, that, that period is where we thought we were really good at. We were really bad on it early, but at the end of the season, we were really good late clocks because our whole mindset was if we can't score early, Let's let's get as late as we can on the clock and really grind these teams down and force them into these kind of switches. And now let's let's take advantage of of what we do really well. Yeah, those butter possessions are so important. And you reference yeah. the Turkish cut. Is that cutting a corner on a drive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cutting a corner or on a pick and roll and throwing it back over the top and, and, and vacating or driving at the nail and, 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 and Turkish cutting on the baseline. So we'll incorporate probably some more of that this year. And we'll talk about some of that stuff. We were running some flare stuff early on pick and rolls um, when the loaded side was there. So we'll continue to tweak that um, as we go and see what works for us. And, and we've changed a little bit of our personnel. So we'll see how that works. Well, and I love the other part of the butter possessions is it's not always default, just a high ball screen, yeah. right? Like there's so, so, so much more creativity in the FIBA yeah. game with those last eight seconds. Yeah. A lot of it's uh, really at the end of the day, it's just baiting you. It's, it's, mm -hmm please make the switch so that we already know where we're going with this ball. And, and we're, it's a bait really at the end of the day. And like I said, early on in the season, it wasn't a bait. It was just poor decisions and a hit or miss kind of situation. And we've got much better as the year went on. Right. It triggers those automatics. And yeah. uh, uh, you know, I, I've heard other NBA coaches who have gone and coached overseas, similar to your situation. And one thing that they've always mentioned to me is scouting reports and that scouting reports in the NBA obviously have a, how do we say this nicely, an incredible depth to them, but not always incredibly valuable, all that information yeah. that you can apply, right? But it's incredible, right. the amount of knowledge. But what they always reference is that they became more efficient when they left the NBA after gone through all that information. Now, they really decide what was important to them. Is that yeah. a similar process for you? Without question, you know, again, it comes back a little bit for Don Nelson and yeah. where he was in his career, but Nelly wanted you to watch the game as an assistant coach. He didn't want you tracking deflections or paint touches or whatever. He just enjoyed the game. You worked all week, sit there, enjoy the game, and coach it. And if I needed something, you better have an answer, but I don't need you writing into your books and tracking stuff and doing all this stuff because he didn't care. Nelly always wanted to know, what do they do in the pick and roll? That was his first question every single time offensive because he was an offensive mind genius. Um, and, and he had simple questions and, and then you go to Europe and it's simpler again. And our, when I was in the NBA, you know, we had the scouting reports and I'm not kidding you. And you probably already know this, but you know, I, if it wasn't 10 to 12 to 15 pages, I'd be shocked on most yeah. of them. You know, the I first five six pages are every play in the world that they've ever ran. And then there's some personnel stuff. We have one page. It's front and back, and that's it. And then we have a personnel page, and that personnel page won't change much because there's only nine teams, and there's not a lot of movement. So once the personnel page is done for the year for us, it's, it's basically done. It's more highlighting the video stuff that is updated generally. But, yeah, it's we. I, my, listen, I'm not smart, and my philosophy is KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. And that's how I, I go about my thinking. I'm a player first, a coach second, and – I want short, concise things that are simple. I don't need to read a, uh, you know, a novel. I just need to know a few quick things that are important to me. Uh, some coaches love statistical things and want to throw those things out there at the players and all that. 
it's just not me. Um, my stuff's very straightforward, very simple. I try to keep it very simple for our players. I never want our players to ever say, well, I didn't know. No, you, you, you knew from day one what our defensive philosophy was, and you know every single game what our defense is. It's not changing. It's, there's nothing really being tweaked. And so there's not a lot of gray areas that we have to worry about. And, and the scouting reports to me are just maybe picking on a few plays of the other opponents and what they might do pick and roll wise. And if they're up the floor in some kind of press. Well, and you reference that you reference that your defense is more of a European type defense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just highlight some of those characteristics. I know like picking up the ball full court, for example, Chase Buford was on the podcast and he referenced that that was a surprise to him because that doesn't happen in the NBA, for example. Can you give yeah. us other things like that? Yeah, I think from us, you know, again, um, it goes back to the early months of being in Tasmania, but there's also some of my philosophy. You couldn't do that in the NBA. No, you know, Rick Pitino tried that with the Knicks and almost ran him out in his first couple months of trying to do what he was doing um, at Kentucky or wherever he came from at that point. But for me, it was, I want to play these guys. There's not a huge difference in, in talent. They're all good at some things, but they all deserve to be on the floor. Let's, let's use their energy up the floor. Um, I got guys that had big motors and, and Magnes and Jared Barstow's and Fabs that would be up there with our bigs. And I knew our guards would be scrappy. So I wanted to be up there as much as I could, 84 feet. We, 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 we jam right away when the ball goes in or if the, uh, when the ball's missed, we'll jam and stay up the floor. If the ball goes in, we're putting something on you and you're just going to have to navigate that pressure and we'll give up some bad, bad decisions possibly, but it's a cumulative effect for me of that kind of pressure. And then when you get to the half court, we're bumping and knocking you and, and not letting you cut through easy. And, and um, our pick and roll coverage is rather aggressive. And our backside is more of a European coverage where we, we're always sending the loaded side bottom guy there in regards to what way the ball's going. Um, and so it, it doesn't change for us. Our aggression is there every night. And if I can't find it, I just get to the next guy. Um, and so those influences to me are hugely important because I think just the wear down factor um, is a benefit. And it, 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 in our group, we had to overcome maybe some lack of talent here or there by doing some of these things to create some turnovers, to create some easy baskets in transition, to speed up teams that were trying to run more, more um, longer sets. And um yeah, we're going to get after it again this year, and we have a few more things up our sleeve. And but that's going to be our mo as long as I'm in the Jack Jumpers. That we're going to be nasty defensively and gritty, and you're going to have to you're going to have to have your hands full when you play us. No, that's great. And and at least if people that don't understand, the rules are different, the spacing is yeah. different, and that allows for it. One NBA assistant who coached in a national program this summer, he told me the biggest takeaway was he couldn't believe how physical it's allowed to be, and that's yeah. a huge difference and allows you to do a lot of different things as a coach, as you said. Yeah, we have a lot of things that we are probably known for now in the NBL, and <laughs> one of them's knocking the hell out of people whenever we can uh, legally, but just making sure that um, you know they know who you are, and um, we call them hellos. We're saying hello uh, when the ball goes up, and we're saying hello until the 40th minute to make sure that you, you know that you're in for a game and, and we'll lay our chips where they are, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to out execute us and outwork us. And, and that was kind of what we hung our head on. Well, it sounds like it perfectly connects with the apple pickers of yeah. Tasmania yeah. as well. Yeah. And the different yeah. people that, as you said, that you already connect to that yeah. work ethic. Yep, yeah, no doubt. I mean, it was, again, all that stuff was reflected in my own personality of how I was playing when I was growing up and how I was coached and how the NBA was when I played in it, how I played in Europe and those are all things that were, were always something that I loved. Um, and that's why the European stuff always was more gravitating to me. And, you know, I know the NBA is about freedom of movement and trying to score a million points and the analytics and shooting the threes. And um, I think we're, there's some teams in, in, in the NBA that are trying to emulate some of that stuff, which is great, but 84 feet is 84 feet. And I think that's an advantage for us. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, two other parts of your career, I want to get into one, first of all, and that's one of your roles was as a pro scout. And I'm curious, what type of influence has that had on on your career in terms of coaching and, uh, you know, being a head coach now? Yeah, I think, um, well, there's two things. Uh, one was I was a short, short amount of time. I was an advanced scout, which is a nightmare of a job. <laughs> Explain that quickly to people. Well, because I don't think people appreciate it. So you're, you're basically... You're on the, the road all year. You're a week ahead of the team of whoever they're playing. So if I'm 
working for Phoenix. I'm probably with the Lakers and Golden State a week ahead. And I've sat there and I'm basically watching their games and I'm scouting. I'm putting the scouting report together to be sent back so that by the time I leave, the team's coming in town and that scouting report's being handed off to the assistants and it's getting funneled back up to the head coach. And you're you're on the road. You're you're living out of the suitcase and you're just moving basically five, six, seven days ahead of the team, uh, seeing these games after games after games. And I actually hated it. And um, I did it for about two or three months, um, kind of as a, a helpful thing more than anything else, because we had some situations where some guys were moving around. It was a nightmare. And the guys that do that are, they're top notch that really do that and can do that every single night. I mean, they're seeing so many games, but I will tell you, if you have a chance to do that, you want to learn the league, you want to learn how to write X's and O's, you want to learn how to write a scouting report. It's a hell of a learning experience. Not guys, a lot of guys don't want to do that, but if you want to start where I started and you work your way through things, that's one box you can tick. The pro scouting was something I really enjoyed because um, especially when I was in Milwaukee working with Larry Harris, you know, I was in charge of going to Europe. I was in charge of some of the lottery stuff. And so I had a lot of freedom with um, that particular um, organization and with Larry, but I had done it a couple of different times and it definitely allows you to evaluate players and see what you like and, and what other coaches that you're working for like and try to find those players that fit their kind of style and, and, it's very helpful for me, obviously, to put 15 players together. Like I said, it took me 58 years to learn all that I had learned to start something from scratch and then start reflecting on what I learned and what I was going to use and what I was bringing with me from Perth or what I was bringing with me from Don Nelson or what I was bringing with me from one of the European coaches I was with. So it was a constant um, in the back of my mind. And so that pro scouting, um, it's not always perfect, but it allows you to identify players and, and, and hopefully you're right a lot of times, but you can be definitely misled and wrong and, and make mistakes. And it's another growth period um, of finding someone that will trust you and your, and your values and what you, you're doing. I just talked to a, a GM yesterday and he just sent me a text. He said, you're right. And I told him last year, Jack White was going to be in the NBA. And the text came back to me, the Jack White from Duke that can't shoot. I said, yes. The Jack White from Duke, the can't shoot. And then, unfortunately, he ruptured his Achilles shortly after that. And then he just texted me back yesterday and said, you were right. And um, you know what you know. And, you, and for me, it doesn't take very long to identify players. It's the, it's the thing that the thing you can't identify until you really spend some time where you coach them is, is, is their heart and where, really where they're sitting. You can, you can see talent. But what's going on in their brain and their heart, that's what you really got to do your investigative work. Well, you've got incredible experiences with that and uh, other really cool experiences. I, I may miss some of them, but you've been with different national programs. Yeah. You were head coach of the Dominican, you're with Canada, yeah. you were Turkey, you were China. Am I missing any? But uh, well, talk those, a little bit yeah. about those experiences. Yeah, I mean, they're all, I mean, obviously, country wise, they're all unique. Um, I say unique. One of the greatest experiences <laughs> in my lifetime was uh, probably top two or three, and Tasmania now is catapulted into that top two or three. Is, was coaching the Turkish national team in the world champ uh, in the European championships at that time. And um, watching an entire country, I mean, literally an entire country rally behind this team with Hito Turkolo and, and Mehmet Okur and, and be a part of that and play old Yugoslavia in, in the last game with Divac and Peja Stjokovic in the championship in Istanbul. And just an incredible like six or seven weeks of my life. And I played there and all my friends, I have so many Turkish friends that I played with and they're in the air and they come back and be a former player for FS Pilsen. And then they come back and work with one of my coaches that coached me at FS and some of my best friends inside the Turkish Federation is just, yeah, it was just a remarkable experience of just seeing it. And again, being back in European basketball and then, you know, that translates into taking your team over in Dominican where we're playing outdoors and practicing and there's no nets and, you know, you're getting ready for qualifications to go to, to play Cuba or the Bahamas, or you're going over to Puerto Rico, their biggest rivalry, and you're practicing outside in some 99 degrees out in the humidity. And they're all just, you're just gaining experience. And you're gaining, you know, what to do and what not to do. And you're gaining your temperament and, and how you're going to be. And, you know, to coach the Canadian national team was a great experience. And then just recently of why I got to Australia was like, uh, Yao Ming called me when I was with Minnesota to go coach the, um, Chinese national team in the world championships three years ago, while uh, Brian Gorjan had just left the spot. I came into it. And so I spent five months in Beijing and um, 
I met Trevor Gleason. They brought an Australian team over for a week uh, for us to play against their select team. And I just bumped into Trevor every day going on the bus and off the bus. And they were traveling with us, not thinking twice other than it's a hell of a league you're playing in. And you're an unbelievable coach over there and not thinking anything other than I'm just going home after this and I'll probably find another NBA job. And I got home when that was all over with, with the world championships and um, the phone rang it was Trevor. He said, uh, one of my coaches had left. I got a job for you. And I was like, what? I got on a plane a couple of days later and flew to Perth and won a championship with Trevor and um, COVID hit right after the end of that. And I knew I had to get back to Australia to get this job in Tasmania. I felt, so I came back to Perth with Trevor again and went through about 300 guys to get the Tasmanian job. And, and yeah, I wouldn't, if Trevor wouldn't have made that call, I don't know if I would have got into Australia because it's such a hard market and such, I mean, it's exploding. The NBL is exploding. The league is incredible. There's only 10 teams, but it's a dog fight every night. And the talent just keeps growing and growing and more NBA guys are going in from Australia and it's, more of the rising stars program yeah, as well. The, it's, it's exploding and it's this really expansion hard. is huge, right? Like that's it's been a long time since they added a team. Yeah. And it's hard as a foreigner anywhere you go to try to coach over somewhere. You just mm -hmm. you're navigating whether they like you, you don't like you, you're taking one of their jobs from their own of their own, you know, countrymen. You, there's a lot of things going on. And to get one of these jobs, I felt like I was extremely, extremely lucky because it's just such a good league and quality of life and everything else that's going on over there. But here I am. Well, I think everyone that listening is uh, beaming with a smile at your path and how the universe has spoke to you and brought to yeah. you to this situation now. And obviously very deserving, but uh, maybe just in wrapping this up, give some advice to the coaches uh, that are in the same position, trying to be stick with itness to be able to get to these opportunities. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, like I said, it took me 58 years to find this. And I think, um, don't quit. That, that's, it's, it's, it's as easy as that, really. It's, it's, it's going to go coach where some other people just don't want to, or their ego says, I can't go there. Like I was in the NBA and I went and coached the Dominican Republic. You know, they have their third world, no, no facilities, no nothing. I didn't go there to change the world. I went there to see what do I know and how can I coach there for two months? It, it was just an opportunity, really. It didn't drive anything it didn't get me more jobs necessary or less. It was just one more growth period for me. And I think as a, as a young coach, you got to find every opportunity to go coach, to find who you are, to, to know uh, your strengths and weaknesses, what you need to work on, whether that's boys, girls, whatever level, go coach, go, go experience it and know you're going to get kicked in the teeth and uh, people aren't going to like you and you're going to get yelled at and people are going to get you on social media and they're going to tell everything about you that they don't like. And, and you're going to be on a roller coaster ride if you really stay with it. You know, one of my former teammates and my good friend and I play for his dad, Eric Musselman, is probably another great example. You know, me and Eric grew up together. Uh, he's my point guard in high school. And, you know, he was trajectory going this way uh, when he got back into the NBA. And then it went this way. And he had a lot of um, stay with it to go actually take a college job with, with Herb in, in Arizona State and eat some humble pie and say, I got to start somewhere else and try something different. And now look at them. Um, you just have to, you have to stay on it and you're going to eat humble pie and you're going to get kicked in the teeth. And it's just a matter of whether you give in or give up um, and don't chase a job for money. Don't ever do that. Um, be smart in your selections and get good people around you. Um, and you just hope for the best. Uh, but like I said, 58 years. So, Awesome. Coach, I can't thank you enough. So much great advice and insights throughout and uh, awesome to be a part of your journey now. So thanks Appreciate for sharing it. the game. Yeah, anytime. Thanks.